tonight on CBC Vancouver News. The, the people who killed your son. Yeah. And, and looking at them. You can just imagine what goes through our minds. Justice for Luca, the young men who killed him in Whistler are sentenced also. I believe there was a second shooter there that night as well. Vancouver police released new details about a shooting that left an innocent teen dead. And it was a staggering amount of money. Hundreds of millions more than first reported. The shocking findings from a CBC News investigation into casino money laundering. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. Cheers broke out in a Vancouver courtroom this morning when three young men were sentenced in the killing of Luca Gordich. The Burnaby teenager was stabbed to death on the May long weekend almost four years ago in Whistler. The three accused were all juveniles at the time of the killing and are now in their 20s. Bell Peary was in court for the sentencing and joins us live with more tonight. Bell? The question going into court was, would the three be sentenced as youth or as adults? Well, it was a split decision. Two of the men got one sentence, the third another. It was one final trip to court for the Gordich family. The wait for sentencing of three men convicted in their son's killing has been going on for well over a year. Even this morning I was going on the email to see if they cancelled it. Luca Gordich was swarmed and killed outside a convenience store in Whistler in May 2015. The 19-year-old was stabbed three times in the chest, once in the heart. The attack was instigated by Arvin Golik over a petty dispute between the two young men. Golik was eventually found guilty of manslaughter and is serving a seven-year sentence in prison. Now three others who participated in the killing have also been sentenced. One as an adult to life in prison with no eligibility for parole for seven years. The other two, both convicted of manslaughter, will spend 18 months in a youth facility and another 18 months under supervision. I'm surprised. I'm happy about that. I am. Because I know how the justice system works. It's, you know, you can't expect too much. The Crown prosecutor in the case said it was one of the most difficult of his career. This is right up there with about as bad as it gets. I mean, a completely lovely, innocent young man. You know, you can see it affects me right now just thinking about it. Uh, he he uh, stood up to a bully, and this is what he got. Lawyers for the trio going to jail have 30 days to appeal the sentences. Hopefully they, they, they won't be successful if they appeal, but what can, what can we do? Luca's family says the grief, anger and pain they feel over his killing will never be over. Luca's parents say that they've established some scholarships in Luca's name as a way to build a legacy. They told me about that and their lives when we sat down to chat at their home this afternoon. I'll have that exclusive interview with the family coming up a little bit later in the newscast. Mike, Anita. All right, Bill, thanks very much. It's been one year since an innocent teenager was killed on East Broadway, caught in the crosshairs of a gang conflict. 15-year-old Alfred Wong was in the back seat of his parents' car when he was hit by a stray bullet. As the CBC's Tina Lovegreen reports, police have now released new information about the case. We believe this was involved in the crime. Police are looking to speak with the owners of this Pontiac, Montana, or anyone who may have information about this car. They'll circle evidence where we believe there's either DNA or fingerprints. It was seized a month after a shooting on East Broadway and Ontario Street that killed two people, including an innocent teenager. 15-year-old Alfred Wong was riding in the back seat of his parents' car. They were heading home after a family dinner but were caught in an exchange of gunfire. We were uh, with the Wong family uh, on Christmas Eve, and it's an extremely difficult time approaching the one-year anniversary and kind of through the first Christmas season without a loved one. <laughs> a year later, investigators have released new details about the case. Two people that have opened fire that night. Police say 23-year-old Kevin Whiteside, who was also murdered that night, wasn't the intended target as they originally thought but instead was in the area to kill drug dealer Matthew Navis Rivas. Kevin Whiteside shot at Matthew Navis Rivas. At about the same time, a second unidentified person opened fire. 
Both were involved in gangs. Police say Navis Rivas was leaving the Indochine restaurant with a female companion when the gunfire started. While he was unharmed that night, the 27-year-old was gunned down in front of an East Vancouver elementary school in July while walking his dog with his girlfriend. Police say while they have made progress in the case, they need more information from the public. They've released this dash cam video of a black pickup truck seen driving erratically during the time of the crime. Kind of cuts across a few lanes and heads south on Ontario. We believe that person, based on their driving maneuver, was aware that there was an incident unfolding or a shooting unfolding. And they believe the driver may have witnessed something that can help solve the case and catch the second shooter so they can bring some closure to a family who continues to grieve a year later. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. A 40-year-old Ridge Meadows man is in custody tonight after a double stabbing in Chilliwack. Happened just before midnight at a home in the 45,000 block of Hodgins Avenue. When police arrived, they found two people who'd been stabbed. They were taken to hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. A suspect was arrested later by Hope RCMP near Jones Lake. Police believe the stabbings were targeted. Well, it's grand theft postal style. Burnaby Apartments ransacked of every piece of mail in a matter of minutes. As the CBC's Megan Bachelor reports, several of the thieves were caught on camera. It's a sight becoming all too common for Burnaby apartment buildings. Suspects, sometimes masked, find their way into the building, equipped with tools for prying open mailboxes. Police say in some cases they managed to clear out hundreds of boxes in just minutes. There isn't much we can do about it, but the guys knew what they were doing, obviously, on that. That's very scary, no? Burnaby RCMP released video showing five suspects they're looking for connected to a number of mail thefts in recent weeks. They couldn't say if they're all working together. What they're doing is they're prying the main door open, which is how the, the mail, uh, the Canada Post uses a key to open the, the slot. Uh, but what they're doing is they're prying it open and gaining access to upwards of 100 mailboxes at one time and clearing it out in minutes. So they're not there for very long. Not there long, but doing big damage. Police say it's the personal information in that mail the suspects are after to create online profiles. We have seen cases where um, a suspect has ordered credit cards and have gone back to the residence uh, and intermittently checked, waiting for that credit card to arrive. This Burnaby apartment building was also targeted. It's not known if any of the five suspects police are after are responsible, but it's got people living here rethinking their habits. Because people at night, it's kind of scary out here. You know, you see people hanging around. But um, it means that you have to pick your mail up every day. Burnaby RCMP's Crime Prevention Unit is working with building managers to increase security in light of the thefts. Megan Batchelor, CBC News, Burnaby. Secret reports obtained by CBC News show a staggering amount of dirty money was laundered at Vancouver area casinos before the province cracked down. One former investigator pegs the amount at 10 times the previous estimate. He and his boss were fired after trying to sound the alarm on the, quote, horrendous amounts of suspicious cash. Eric Rankin of our CBC Investigates unit has the exclusive story and joins us now. Eric, what have you uncovered? Through a freedom of information request, we got our hands on two confidential internal reports that had been compiled in late 2013 and 2014. These reports were drawn up by the top investigators with the province's Gaming Policy Enforcement Branch, and the findings were intended for senior government. The reports show the investigators repeatedly raised the alarm over dirty money being laundered through BC casinos. They warned of a massive escalation of suspicious currency transactions, hundreds of thousands of dollars, often in 20s, the currency of street drugs used by organized crime, brought in in suitcases and shopping bags. But the investigators were also frustrated because they felt little or nothing was being done by casino overseers in the province, including the BC Lottery Corporation and the then BC Liberal government. And Eric, last summer, former RCMP Deputy Commissioner Peter German brought down his dirty money report. Uh, he estimated more than $100 million in suspicious cash had passed through casinos in recent years. How does that compare to what you found? 
Well, it appears Peter German lowballed that estimate. The real number is at least seven times higher, according to numbers we've compiled. $700 million between about 2010 to 2017. But one of the senior investigators who authored the reports believes it was even more, $1 billion. The numbers would have exceeded $1 billion for sure in suspicious currency transactions. It was a staggering amount of money. So, Eric, why weren't the warnings in these reports heeded? Well, that's the $1 billion question. About a month after filing the money laundering report at the end of 2014, Joe Schalk and his boss, the executive director of the investigation division of the Gaming Policy Enforcement Branch, were fired. Schalk believes the message was clear. His provincial bosses weren't going to listen anymore. And, Eric, what do the officials who were in charge of casinos at that time say about all of this? The BC Lottery Corporation says, quote, these claims of inaction are categorically false and that it repeatedly flagged concerns to police and gaming investigators. The man who was the minister responsible for gaming when these reports were filed says he's not sure he saw them, but takes issue with the claim he didn't act. There is, I think, a tendency on some people's part to want to portray this as a problem that was ignored. It was not. De Jong did create a joint illegal gaming investigation team in 2016, but he and the B.C. Liberals were ousted in 2017. It took crackdowns by the NDP government to vastly reduce the flow of dirty money into casinos in the past year. Eric Rankin, thank you very much. Conservationists are calling it an ecological catastrophe. B.C.'s Fraser River is home to Canada's largest white sturgeon population, but stocks are declining fast. That's prompting new calls for Ottawa to bring in restrictions around some of the fishing practices that are used. Earlier this week, I went out with an angler on his boat to take a look at the situation. The Lower Fraser is home to thousands of white sturgeon. Some living more than 100 years and growing longer than three meters. So we're just looking around here for a concentrated area that'll have some of these juvenile sturgeon. The white sturgeon is a species at risk. It's catch and release only. Kevin Estrada is an angler. He's tagging the fish, collecting tracking data. That research shows a decline of 15,000 juvenile fish in the last four years. Where are they going? Uh, what's happening? So that's just a little guy there. You can see how sharp he is. That's their plate of armor all the way along the sides and the top. Those are their scoots. And so this is what a sturgeon should look like. Yeah, I mean, he's immaculate. He's, uh, he's pristine condition. Far different from these sturgeon he's caught before. Bloody bycatch from gill nets used by commercial fishermen and First Nations to catch salmon. It's not just this size. It's the six foot and the seven foot and the eight foot that are about to spawn. Um, those fish dying along with the little guys, you're losing them at every single age class. In December, a local MP presented a petition in Parliament asking for new restrictions on the use of gill nets in the Fraser, something that doesn't sit well with First Nations. We do catch some and we, uh, we monitor our fishery very heavily and we know how many fish uh, we, uh, we impact, how many we catch and how many we release. And almost all of the fish that we catch are released alive. The Department of Fisheries and Oceans says sturgeon are also threatened by pollution, predators, hunger and habitat loss. It's working to address the threats. But Estrada wants results now. If you had elephants and tigers and owls and eagles tangled up in gill nets um, and it's a visual and you can see it, people would be losing their minds, right? And, uh, and we can't, you can't see a sturgeon, right? Sturgeon aren't in the Coca-Cola commercials. He worries these prehistoric fish will be gone forever if more isn't done to protect them. See you later, buddy. I need a bath. CBC News, <laughs> Mission. And uh, Fisheries Minister Andrew Wilkinson needs to respond to the petition. He says that he'll do that when the, the parliament resumes in Ottawa. Okay, we'll stay on top of that for certain. Mm -hmm. All right, let's bring in uh, Johanna Wagstaff now with our first look at the forecast. The S word uh, is ready and available for use. Yes, that would be not 
Not snow. Snow, <laughs> <laughs> but sun. That's what we've got building for a pretty good looking weekend. Let me start off with the current temperatures out there right now. Five at YVR, so a little cooler than where we were at this time uh, yesterday. Uh, clear skies means that our heat is uh, radiating away. And we just really saw those clearing skies in the past hour or so. Seven's in through the valley, uh, clearing starting to move in from west to east. I think we're done with the showers. We saw a few spits and spots early this morning. Uh, this is the plume of moisture that will continue to bring uh, wet weather to central and northern coastal sections. And we will see a, a bit of an edge towards the south coast tomorrow afternoon. But I think it'll just bring clouds uh, after a fairly sunny start to the day. And that's because this high pressure ridge is continuing to shift westward, pushing clouds and rain also westward. Uh, terrace and inland sections under a rainfall warning. You were under a winter storm warning this time yesterday, uh, but things have warmed up across central and northern sections of the province. Already 30 to 60 millimeters on the ground. Look for another 5 to 10 on top of that. Okay, back to YVR next 24 hours. Down to a 5 tonight. Again, a, a cooler start to your Saturday than we've had the past couple of days. And there is a slight risk of some patchy fog because that's sinking air locking in any lingering moisture. Back out to a 9, wouldn't rule out a 10 or 11 across Metro Vancouver. I've got that round of cloud though moving back in towards the afternoon. But Sunday and beyond, I'm very excited to tell you more about. <laughs> we are also very excited to hear about it. Thanks so much, Johanna. You're welcome. And if you missed any of our stories, they are available for you to watch at any time. Just follow us on Twitter at CBC News BC. You can also watch this newscast streaming live and on demand on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, cbc.ca slash bc. Well, there's been a deadly bus crash in Ottawa. Three people killed, many more injured. Coming up, the latest from the scene of this accident. Hello to our viewers tuning in on YouTube, Facebook, and cbc.ca. This next story is one of the most talked about articles on our website today. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be a family-friendly game, but some parents aren't buying it. It's called Cut the Wire, and it gives players clues to defuse a toy bomb before time runs out. Real pipe bombs were sent to some politicians in the U.S. in the fall, and some shoppers say a toy bomb shouldn't be on the shelves. CBC Business reporter Jacqueline Hansen has more. The device is ticking and is about to go up. A plastic bomb-like toy that players try to defuse before time runs out. Trust me, it's so much fun. Yep, it's really fun. <laughs> Online toy reviewers, often given toys by the manufacturer for free, seem to like it. Okay, you are showing the game. But this London, Ontario mom saw it on display at her local Walmart and thinks the game is a bust. Who made the decision? to take a bomb that's dangerous, uh, put it in a pretty little box with a family playing with it and put it on a shelf. It's desensitizing our children to what's dangerous. She posted about it on Facebook and so have other bewildered shoppers. In the US, Target stopped stocking it. It says it takes customer feedback seriously and work to remove this item from our assortment. Walmart Canada says it appreciates the concerns raised regarding the toy and that it didn't intend to offend anyone by carrying it. The game is still for sale here and at other Walmart locations in Canada, but the company says once its stock runs out, it won't order any more. It's either an appropriate toy or it's an inappropriate toy. This retail consultant and former toy buyer says Walmart's response falls short. Bombs are associated with terrorism and war. There's really no other way to say it. Um, and I think it's just, it's, it's, it's sad and I think it's, it's just completely inappropriate um, for really any retailer to sell this. He says that while some Canadians may not take issue with the toy, retailers should remove it rather than risk upsetting any customers. I don't want to shop there, period, anymore. Like the decision makers are clearly missing something. CBC reached out to Yulu, the company that makes the game, about the concerns, but it has not responded. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, London, Ontario. Definitely an odd choice for kids. Yeah, it is. Um, although you do see those kinds of things on crime shows and what have you, you know, mm -hmm. like cutting the wires and all that. But mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's a toy. That's a toy. All right. Well, mm. a reminder that we're only streaming the first half of our show on Facebook. If you want to watch the full broadcast, you'll have to make the switch over to our YouTube channel.
in a few minutes. And if you have any questions about our stories, post them in the comments. And we'll do our best <laughs> yeah. to get them answered. We're going to be back in just a few seconds with more news on CBC News Vancouver. Three people are dead, nearly two dozen hurt, many of them seriously, after a crash involving a transit bus in Ottawa. It happened just before 4 o'clock this afternoon as rush hour was getting underway. The double-decker slamming into a bus shelter, pinning passengers at the front under their seats. Two of the people killed were passengers on the bus. The third was standing on the platform. Of the 23 people hurt in the crash, nine are in critical condition tonight. In the chaos after the crash, many people were left searching for information about loved ones who may have been on the bus at the time. We've been trying to call him and uh, there's no response. It goes directly to voicemail, so I'm hoping that it's just a mix-up, that maybe his schedule was off or something. He works in a restaurant, yeah. but I've called there and they said he left a couple of hours ago, so... Police detained the driver of the bus at the scene and say she will be interviewed about what happened leading up to the crash. Anger over police action on the Wet'suwet'en territory in B.C. extended all the way to Ontario today. That's where it resulted in a big slowdown on Canada's busiest highway. Well, one group of protesters, about 20 trucks, slowed traffic to 40 kilometers an hour. This was the scene on Highway 401 near Kingston. Organizers called it a solidarity slowdown and say it's a reminder Indigenous people have rights to the land. On Monday, 14 people were arrested at that roadblock in northern B.C. Since then, Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs have reached an agreement with the RCMP to allow pipeline workers access for pre-construction surveys. <laughs> An investigation from our colleagues at CBC Marketplace has found plastic intended for recycling in Canada ended up in garbage piles in Malaysia. Only 11% of plastic used in this country is recycled. The CBC's David Common looks at what's being done to cut down on plastic in the first place. Grocery store shelves are full of plastic. Sometimes even the coconuts are wrapped. It's cheap and durable, but one use and the plastic is tossed. But it's all covered in plastic. Blue boxes barely make a dent. Just over a tenth of all plastic actually gets recycled in Canada. Bread wrapped in plastic, right. cheese wrapped in plastic. Ground beef in a plastic, covered by plastic, in a plastic bag, in another plastic bag. Yes. Some ends up here, mountains of it, shipped to Malaysia, found by Greenpeace. And in there, some from Canada. A grocery bag from Sobeys, a milk bag from the Maritimes, another from a wine store in Halifax, birdseed packaging from Ontario, and a heavy plastic bag from Windsor Salt out of Quebec, shipped around the world to be recycled, but like most plastics, just not worth it. So instead, it's burned. 40% of all plastic comes from packaging from places like Loblaws and Sobeys. They often don't leave consumers with an alternative. Plastic coats their products. Neither Loblaws nor Sobeys would share with us any targets for tackling it. In England, though, one store didn't wait. It eliminated plastic packaging from 2,000 products in just 10 weeks. We work with brands and with supermarkets to try and find solutions to basically cut off the plastic tap. Frankie Gillard managed the transition away from plastic. This is a paper bag yeah. and this has a cellulose film. So, so it is looks it plant based? Is it's, that what plant, it's completely yeah. plant based. Across the store, hundreds of examples. And for suppliers who weren't willing to make the change? Well, you basically say we're going to delist your product. Really? You go that far? Oh yeah, we have gone that far. I'm going to find somebody else that sells what you sell in an environmentally friendly packaging. Yeah. With the volume power of Loblaws or Sobe, she believes they too could force suppliers to change and change quickly. David Common, CBC News, Toronto. The full investigation airs tonight on Marketplace at 8 p.m. on CBC Television or watch on our streaming app at cbc.ca slash watch. 
Well, in just under four hours, an iconic viaduct will be closing for good. No, no not here in Vancouver. Seattle's Alaskan Way Viaduct is shutting down to make way for a new tunnel. However, that tunnel won't be ready for at least another three weeks. So if you're planning on heading down the I-5 and through the city to SeaTac uh, in the next month or so, prepare for some delays. In the meantime, Seattle residents are taking in the viaduct's views one last time. I love driving by the wheel and it made traffic a little bit more bearable to be able to see out to the water. I have a, a good girlfriend who lives here and she and her boyfriend went on a like final drive together. And it's, it's nice that people have a, a good feeling towards it. There will be a celebration for the completion of the tunnel project to give people one last chance to take in the viaduct's views. That's happening February 2nd and 3rd. Demolition expected to begin after the tunnel opens, which could be as soon as February 4th. Sentences were handed down today in the swarming death of 19-year-old Luca Gordich in Whistler in 2015. Coming up, Luca's parents sit down for an exclusive interview with our Belle Puri. That's next on CBC Vancouver News. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. We believe there's people who have additional information about these murders who have yet to come forward. 
New details about a gang shooting a year ago in Vancouver where 15-year-old Alfred Wong was killed in the crossfire. Investigators believe a second person killed in the gunfire that day was actually in the area to carry out a hit himself. The intended target is now dead, killed several months later in an unrelated shooting. The numbers would have exceeded $1 billion for sure in suspicious currency transactions. It was a staggering amount of money. Hundreds of millions more. A CBC News investigation finds 10 times more money was laundered through BC casinos than previously reported. The author of a secret internal report says it's to the tune of $1 billion between 2010 and 2017. And a man has been handed a life sentence in the killing of Luca Gordich outside a 7-Eleven in Whistler almost four years ago. Two other men were sentenced to 18 months in custody and 18 months supervision. The CBC's Belle Puri spoke with Gordich's family at their home shortly after the sentences were handed down and were getting a better understanding of what their lives are like now. Anytime we are not doing much, that's all, at least that's all I think. And uh, even when you wake up, that's what you think. And when you are not busy, that's what you think. So we try to be really busy, like with work or exercise or with now with grandchildren that helped us greatly. I do suffer. I suffer with anxiety. I have depression. I have PTSD. Like I'm on medication. Like I don't think I'll ever be able to get off it. Like I'm so consumed with my thoughts, you know, about my poor Luca, like they stabbed him. They swarmed and stabbed him for nothing. You never get over it. Like, there's no closure. You've had weddings. You mentioned your grandchildren. Yes. And any time when there is occasion like that, wedding or any kind of party, like Christmas or stuff like that, that's when the m mostly we are sick. Like, you know, you think it's it should be happy day, but that's when we think the mostly about Luca. It was difficult to get through those weddings? Yes, of yes. course. Like, I'm happy for my kids and obviously, but it's, it's, it's a sick, gut-wrenching feeling every day. The closure will be when, when I die or when we die. I can't, I can't, it's hard to live. It's actually hard to live. Just tell me about your grandchildren. I mean, there, there's happiness in that. Well, they, they, they especially now, they start, uh, actually one of them start crawling and it's hard to hold them and uh, it's fun. That, you know, that's what makes us sort of happy. Like, you know, we are happy for our children and grandchildren. We're in the moment. In the moment, but then, then again goes back. But your children have honored their, their brother in their children, right? Yeah. What did they name them? Well, one's Gianluca and the other one's Luca. <laughs> yeah. How much have you two changed? We keep going and we encourage each other that uh, we have to keep going because of our other kids and grandchildren. And sometimes people say, well, if you want to be 20 again, would you go back? I said, no, I would never. I want to be 80, never mind, like, you know, t uh, 20, because of, because of, just because of this. Does all of this, has it had an impact on how you treat other people? We, uh, I think now that this happened, we have to uh, honor uh, Lucas' legacy. So what we do, we have a few scholarships that we give every year for kids. And then when we hear someone is in need of uh, uh, help, we we gladly want to help. We donate to and like we donate variety and, and all those We donate telephones. to Children's Hospital and all that. Uh, in Luca's name. In yeah. Luca's name. You had said, Clara, that you know you had to leave the other house. You had to get away. Mm -hmm. Come here. Is he a part of this house? Well, he still has his own bedroom. I still have everything. Like, it's really hard, like, to let go of those things. Because. Really hard. Arvin Golich will be out at some point, mm -hmm. and the two men sentenced as youth yeah. are going to be out and about. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Like, I'm concerned for the citizens. Like, 
and we are all, we live in Burnaby, we, we're going to bump in each other. This is not an end, a close? Yeah, there's no end. Like, honestly, I wish nobody, you, you can't close it, you know, when parents lose a kid, it's, there's nothing worse. I wish you well. Thanks Thank for talking Thank to you. us. Thank you. At 26 minutes before 7 o'clock on this Friday evening, a live look down Georgia Street in downtown Vancouver. Shaping up to be a sunny weekend, Johanna's forecast is coming up next. Well, it's certainly a chilly take on cardio. That's right. Two men were spotted swimming laps in the shallows of English Bay this morning. We swim up to one hour in the, in the ocean, yeah. An hour? Yeah, like yeah. a few days ago we did yeah. one hour, yeah. It certainly makes the polar bear dip seem a little like child's play when you're talking an hour. Temperatures at the tourist hotspot hovered around a balmy seven degrees today. The pair said it was enough to give the skin a slight burning sensation. That was the uh, temperature of the water. And yeah, that would that would smart. The, temp the water temperature? <laughs> yes. The water temperature? Yes, was about seven. But okay. that's quite chilly. And does it fluctuate yeah. much? Like It doesn't actually fluctuate. Right. That's the gem of BC weather. I'm glad you knew that. Yeah. Mm. But it's just that it's cold outside. So exactly. Right. Little... Yeah. So they were crazy. There you go. I mean, the rest of the country is going. <laughs> that's that summer for us. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we do have milder air continuing to stick around. So if that looked appealing, you've got some good uh, English Bay swimming days ahead. Let me take you through the time lapse today. Uh, some gray to start. Uh, we did see a few showers lingering this morning, just a few spits and spots, and then things cleared out uh, towards the end of the time lapse. So uh, just about before noon, starting to see some sunny breaks. It was by no means an all blue sky day, day there were the uh, raindrops on the lens there but definitely drier and feeling almost like spring dare I say out there five right now in through Vancouver so temperature starting to drop down still dealing with some very cold air across central Canada in fact 
Uh, wind chills in through Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, getting close to minus 20s tonight. Uh, very deep Arctic chill tracking towards Atlantic Canada. Uh, our high pressure system is shifting westward and in fact seen some milder temperatures spill over the Rockies. Calgary was a plus three today, which uh, I think a lot of people got out to enjoy east of the Rockies as well. Taking you through the overnight and we are watching for that risk of some patchy morning fog as I mentioned earlier. Winds will be quite calm here Saturday at 6 a.m. I don't think the model is picking up that risk of fog. But as I take you through the day towards the afternoon hours, we may see uh, that very distinct cloud band cross over. So because it's such a narrow band where we've got the blue skies and the overcast skies, we may end up moving in a little sooner or we may end up with a few, uh, with a few more hours of the blue sky than the latest model run is showing. It's just that we're right on the edge of that band of cloud and precip. But I do think it'll stay dry and mainly sunny for your Saturday. Back up to a nine, as I mentioned earlier, Earlier. Taking you through that big picture, you can just slowly start to see that high pressure shifting westward through the weekend, but we do have a few clouds trying to skim the edge of that ridge. Uh, most of the precip, though, towards uh, central and northern coastal sections. And then that ridge really helps clear us out for Sunday and Monday and Tuesday and beyond as I take you through, well, a bit beyond uh, the seven day forecast. So uh, not bad as we head into the weekend. S above seasonal temperatures, we're still about a seven for this time of the year. Uh, notice though, as we head into early next week, uh, some chilly overnights, and that's just because we're seeing all of our heat escape. So chilly starts, seasonal ends, blue sky in between. Uh, this is one of the longest sunny stretches we have seen in quite some time. It does look like we uh, return to a soggier pattern for Thursday. At this point though, not a washout, just an easy transition. So uh, make all your outdoor plans now. It's looking good. Yep. Good stretch, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, uh, we are seeing more and more of them on the road these days, electric vehicles. Mm. Uh, but while they're becoming a common sight in Vancouver, that's not the case in remote communities. Up north, they have, uh, they are a rare sight indeed. And Philip Murray met with one pioneer driver and has more on how his car is performing in the cold. It's the first winter for Michael Simon's car, a Tesla Model 3 he bought in Vancouver. Well, now that we have a little colder weather, I'm actually running a few tests to see how the car performs. And uh, so far, I've been actually very pleased with it. The temperatures this week have meant the first real test in Yukon winter weather. What's the coldest you've driven the car so far? Um, when I drove away from home yesterday, it was minus 39. Simon says he's pleased overall, but the battery is affected by the cold. He says the Tesla gets about half to two-thirds of its usual range. So I should get 350 kilometers instead of 500 maybe? But still, obviously, enough to get to work and back. Yeah, for, for me, it's uh, more than I need to in the daily commute, for sure. Yukon's government says only 12 electric vehicles are registered in the territory. Other parts of the world with northern climates have shown more interest. For instance, in Norway, about 60% of new cars sold last year had some measure of electric power. Philippe Rain, CBC News, Whitehorse. Her parents were murdered, and this 13-year-old Wisconsin girl had been missing since October. Now she's been found alive after escaping from her captor. More on the police investigation coming up.
It is supposed to be a payday for U.S. federal employees, but thanks to the partial government shutdown, they are doing without. With no end in sight, many are worried about how they'll pay for groceries and cover their rent. CBC's Ellen Morrow has the details. At midnight tonight, the shutdown will become the longest in U.S. history, and it's set to continue for some time. Politicians have gone home for the weekend. There's no agreement between Republicans and Democrats how to proceed, and President Trump is dug in on wanting border wall funding before he'll sign any bill to get the government back up and running. Meanwhile, today, for the first time, federal workers are missing out on their paychecks because of this shutdown. That means having trouble paying the bills and anxiety over when this will all end. Here's what some of those workers are saying today. It makes you sick, it is. It's a pit in your stomach, it's worries, it's just, you know, emotions and, you know, you don't know when, when this is all going to sort itself out. We're the only branch of the military that is not guaranteed a paycheck during these times. My husband's in there making homemade bread because it's cheaper than buying a loaf at the store. I have enough for one more mortgage payment and I got to go to CarMax tomorrow and sell my car. And that woman is not alone. Federal workers are starting to find different ways to make money, selling possessions, driving for Uber, babysitting, all trying to make ends meet. Not only that, an airport uh, in Miami, Miami International Airport, will close a terminal early for three days because of airport security screeners who are not getting paid, calling in sick for work. So more and more impacts of the shutdown are beginning to be felt as the political wrangling goes on with no and in sight. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. A protest in downtown Windsor today as Unifor staged a protest over GM's decision to close its Oshawa plant. The union is trying to keep pressure on the automaker. CBC's Olivia Stefanovic was at the protest, which was held within sight of the looming GM headquarters in Detroit. As executives at General Motors headquarters in Detroit met with investors this morning, Canadian auto workers gathered here across the river for a counter meeting of sorts, a rally to show the company they're not letting the Oshawa plant close without a fight. They came by the bus loads, picking up signs, flags and T-shirts. It was an easy decision, 100 percent. I'm supposed to be at work this afternoon. Obviously, I'm not uh, going in. I won't be back in time, but uh, it was an easy decision. It's because you have to show solidarity. The, the only way to, to beat these corporate greedy people. Generations of General Motors workers who say they feel betrayed. It's a bag of mixed emotions, you know. It's, uh, you're tr everybody's there supporting one another, but at the end of the day, it's, it's scared. I mean, where there's fear and uh, anxiety, panic, you know. Um, uncertainty. But they took their frustration out at a demonstration organized by their union, Unifor. Sell here! But GM says its decision is final, part of a global restructuring plan, a move towards building self-driving and electric vehicles. We've told the union numerous times that the decision will stand because we've looked at all the alternatives and financially and economically they don't work. We reviewed all of their uh, submissions and they only increased the costs. Just as the demonstration got underway, the company announced profits for 2018 are higher than expected. Still, not enough to save 2,500 jobs in Oshawa. The union calls that corporate greed. Unifor isn't giving up. It's calling for a meeting with the CEO of GM, the Premier of Ontario, Doug Ford, and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, despite GM's insistence that there's nothing that can be done. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Windsor, Ontario. Police in Wisconsin have a suspect in custody tonight in connection with the kidnapping of a 13-year-old girl. Jamie Kloss had been missing for nearly three months. She disappeared on October 15th after her parents were found shot to death at the family home. The CBC's Kim Brunhuber reports. 88 days, 88 days of hope, of prayers against all the odds, answered. I had hope every day. Every day there was hope. But relatives now admit hope of finding 13-year-old Jamie Kloss had been fading. After all, it had been almost three months since that night in mid-October when police entered Kloss's home in rural Wisconsin to find her parents shot to death. The front door was open and Jamie was gone. A national police hunt turned up nothing 
And then yesterday afternoon, in a remote area about an hour north of her home, a woman was walking her dog when Kloss came up to her. She just said, I'm lost and I don't know where I am and I need help. So Nutter pounded on her neighbor's door. The door opened up and her dog came through and Jeannie walked in and said, this is Jamie Kloss and call 911. I was in absolute shock. Kloss's hair was matted and her shoes were too big. It was, Kaczynska says, like seeing a ghost. She looked exactly the same as she did in her picture, um, a little bit thinner, I would say. And then she looked really tired and like she's been fighting a battle for weeks. Kloss had managed to escape the home in which she was allegedly being held by 21-year-old Jake Patterson. Police arrested Patterson as he was driving around trying to find Kloss. In cases like this, we often need a big break. And it was Jamie herself who gave us that break. Authorities say Patterson targeted the teen and acted alone, but doesn't believe he had any prior contact with Kloss or her family and are still struggling to find a motive. I know all of you are searching for the answer of why any of this happened. Believe me, so are we. Kloss was hospitalized, evaluated and questioned by authorities before being reunited with her relatives. It's just unbelievable and we're all, all just so grateful and happy. The long, agonizing wait now, finally over. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Los Angeles. A Saudi teenager who took to social media to plead for safe asylum is now en route to Canada. The Prime Minister confirming Canada has agreed to welcome Rahaf Mohammed al -Kunan. The UNHCR uh, has made a request of Canada that we uh, accept uh, Ms. al uh, as a refugee, and we have accepted. The UNHCR, or United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, granted refugee status to the 18-year-old two days ago. She traveled on her own to Bangkok last Saturday, claiming abuse by her family. She said she hoped to reach Australia, but Thai officials seized her passport. So she holed up in a hotel and began sending out online pleas for help. Thai authorities now say she's already flown out of their country en route to Canada. Justin Trudeau says our country is pleased to stand up for human rights and women's rights. Well, if you're heading south to beat the rain and the cold, beware there is a shortage of the popular Twin Ricks vaccine. It's used in adults, kids and infants to prevent hepatitis A and B. Robin Miller has more on why it's in such short supply. You are a traveler. The Twin Ricks vaccine helps protect against both hepatitis A and B, but finding it could be a challenge. Jennifer Perlin found that out firsthand. She called 15 Ottawa pharmacies and had no luck. It was frustrating. I mean, they all said the same thing. So I, you know, everybody seemed to be experiencing this similar frustration. Perlin's doctor recommended the vaccine ahead of a family cruise. Eventually, she found Twinrix at a travel clinic but had to pay for its administration. She worries other travelers might be deterred by the price and inconvenience of calling around. There doesn't seem to be um, any knowledge as to when this problem will be rectified, so I think that's concerning. Scott Watson wishes he knew. The pharmacist says he's been turning customers away. Right now I have none. Right now I, we have got some recently, but we've used it up on people that have already been waiting. So if anybody brought us a prescription today, we'd be out of luck. The vaccine is available at some travel clinics, but supply is limited. We do have a supply here, uh, and, uh, but, but because of the shortage, uh, we're trying to, 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 to protect our supply you know, for those who really do need the Twin Ricks. Dr. Robert Birnbaum specializes in travel medicine and says the dual vaccine isn't necessary for all travelers because Hep B is usually sexually transmitted. But if you're taking a one-week trip to the Dominican Republic or Cuba or Costa Rica, uh, you don't need hepatitis B, so you don't need twin ricks, in other words. You just need a Hep A uh, shot, and that's in, in good supply. The company that makes the vaccine says it's working to get the twin ricks supply back to normal, but can't say exactly when that might happen. In a statement, GSK Canada says that vaccine manufacturing is a complex process that can take between 10 and 26 months to complete. Robin Miller, CBC News, Ottawa. It's a hopeful sign for a population on the brink. A southern resident baby orca spotted as it headed with family towards Victoria. 
And the little orca already has a name. We'll tell you all about it next. incredible energy first time we've ever performed a podcast live it's amazing i think it's just creates an awesome sense of community coming here made me realize how much more i can do i'm michelle elliott tonight on cbc vancouver news Who gets to stay? Don't have to ask me twice for my opinion. Is an endorsement from Vision a blessing or a curse? It's just a drill. It's a giant screen set up just outside our CBC studio. I think that inclusion and diversity, at first, it takes a bit of work sometimes. Happy 20th birthday, CBC Victoria. Really hopeful about the future. Let's give a round of applause for all that's going on here today. The prize was a trip here from Prince George. What if it's not too late? We have another question from the audience. Way better than hot dogs. We raised a heck of a lot of money for local food banks. We did all that. Oh, a lot. Good year. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good yeah. year, yeah. <laughs> all right, uh, some good news now to end the work week. There's a glimmer of hope tonight for BC's endangered southern resident orcas. Researchers have confirmed that it's a new baby swimming with members of L-Pod. This video shot yesterday shows the calf swimming next to the killer whale known as L-77, who had previously been pregnant. With this calf, the pod now has 35 members. That's almost half the population of the southern resident orcas. Now, because L-Pod is numerically greater uh, than J or K-Pod, what happens within L-Pod is critical for the population in terms of the overall numbers. 
The Southern residents have not had a successful pregnancy in three years. Researchers hope this could be just the beginning of a turnaround for the population. There are pregnant whales in both the K-pod and J-pod who have not yet given birth. Oh, that is some great news. That is very positive. Hopefully more good sure. news to come. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. We'll have to see what they call it. Maybe steal some names. <laughs> <laughs> didn't, they, didn't they call it L? Oh, no, it's something next is it Lucky? to L77. Lucky is oh. the name. Lucky. You gonna name your your baby Lucky? Does it? Is that a human name? We'll see. It's maybe a nickname. It makes me think of the Britney Spears song. So I don't know. Yeah, no, you're right. Probably not. <laughs> but good luck to Lucky. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You can always find our news program online, cbc.ca/bc. Dan Burrett is here with your next local news at 11 o'clock after the national. Have a good night. Good night.